Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat, and with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way, I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess a new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv You're listening to Revolution Radio. All right, welcome everybody. I hope you are well, and I thank you for joining us this evening. We are going to be doing the fifth in the series on the the tuning fork and how the 66 books of Isaiah relate to the 66 books of the canon, uh, the King James Version of the Old and New Testament. Bill is not yet at home, so I'm going to be speaking about a few other things, and hopefully he'll be ready for the second hour of the show, or he's going to let me know when he gets in. All right, but I hope everyone is doing well, and I hope that you are having uh, a good new year. Um, All right, sorry, sorry for the technical difficulties here, but I'm going to get things settled. Uh, I wasn't sure that I was going to be doing the first half. And so I'm going to just kind of catch you up on some of the things that I've been working on. Um, Also, this evening, for those that are late night uh, individuals, I will be on with Rob Skiba this evening on his show, Revolutionary Radio which comes on Truth Frequency Radio between midnight and 2 a.m. my time, which is Eastern Time Zone. We'll be discussing my book, my newest book, The 14th, which is the third part of the Flat Earth and Firmament Trilogy, Paradise, the Sides of the North, and the Mount of the Congregation, uh, which is a fascinating topic in and of itself. Um, I'll be bringing forth a lot of detail, tying together the different different ancient accounts of the structure of cosmology and how it relates to the magnetic lodestone mountain at the center of the earth plane called Rupus Negra and also to the mythology surrounding such sea monsters or creatures or anomalous structures, Charbatus, for instance, who is said to be a sea monster, which Odysseus and other adventurers encountered while traveling to and fro uh, across the wide breadth of the earth. And even Jason and the Argonauts and uh, Aeneas, uh, Virgil in the stories of Virgil written by Virgil all of them are said to have encountered this particular phenomena which it makes you wonder whether the ancient cultures the ancient civilizations if they had a more northerly disposition and if they were located as William Warren suggests in his book paradise in the North Pole as the cradle of humanity, whether the mythology surrounding the Hyperboreans and the Atlanteans and um, other cultures, Thule, Asgard, Shambhala, um, all these different ancient cultures and the mythologies surrounding them are suggested to be way up north past the Borealis, which is the north wind. And uh, that's why we the name for the Hyperboreans is, you know, beyond the north wind. 
Um, and so, anyways, these ancient accounts seem to be ascribing and pointing, alluding to a culture which had once been located at the northern extremes. And I know that there has recently been a lot of information that has come out with regard to the Antarctica and how it is connected to a lot of the Anunnaki, the Sumerian, the ancient Sumerian cultures and civilizations and that many scientists, there are stories of scientists having discovered very ancient artifacts and uh, pyramidal structures that a lot of information has recently, especially over this year, been released. Um, talking about even the supposed ancient culture which the Nazi SS, Hitler and his Reich, the Third Reich, that they were involved in and that there's a Operation Tabarind that was headed by the British SS or SAS, the Special Forces, that spoke about and shared in testament how it was that they had located a, a base, New Schwabeland, that was being built by the ancient, uh, well, by the the Nazi regime, but that they were building on top of an already ancient structure, which is similar to what Phil Snyder also specified in his testimony of assisting in the Rand Corporation in their building these deep underground bases. And he said that they were burrowing into already existing structure. And it's interesting because in studying the ancient mythologies and the various ancient texts, there's one specifically, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, which are said to have been written by the Atlantean priest king Thoth, who was part of this ancient Atlantean or Mu culture, this mother culture, which being judged for getting involved in invoking and conjuring very ancient evil and dark entities and opening up doorways, gateways into this realm for them to enter into this plane of existence, that judgment was brought upon them then and that the Most High God had destroyed their culture and their civilization, creating what is in the ancient annals, especially with the work of James Churchward, who did all of the books on Mu, and the lost continent of Mu, the symbols of Mu, the people of Mu, all these different books that he put out, speaking about the, the Nikal um, and his work in translating some of these very ancient stone tablets, uh, having met this one particular priest that was over one of these Buddhist, I don't even know if it was a Buddhist monastery, but one of these ancient temple complexes there in India that he was befriended by this individual and being a caretaker for some of these ancient tablets, James Churchward was able to convince him to bring out these particular tablets and to look into them, to examine their shape and to make sure that they were being preserved in manner that protected them for later generations. And so convincing this particular priest to 
at least examine them, they discovered in bringing them out that they were not being uh, well protected. And so that was the deciding factor for his then deciding to bring them all out for introspection. And in doing so, he taught James Churchward this ancient language, which I believe at the time that this priest was only one of three that still had the capacity to read this ancient Nikal language. And in doing so, um, and, and James taking notes, he was able to relate the story of this ancient mother culture of which the ancient Tibetans the, and the ancient uh, Hindu, the ancient Indian peoples there were part of the inheritors of and that the legacy, the diaspora, was said to have gone out in predominantly five directions to different parts of the world, and that they established the ancient cultures that came up there in Japan, which we know that they say they were seeded by these dragon-like entities these um, seraphic angelic beings. And so there in Japan, also in China, India, that particular area, in the Middle East, the Sumerian culture and civilization which came up, also in South America, and also ancient America, that the diaspora, oh, and also in Egypt, now, and I know that, you know, I'm basically relating more than five locations, but some of these cultures came up from the same. Like, for instance, the Sumerian, the ancient Egyptians, that there was connections there. Um, the Thracian people, which predated them uh, by 2,000 years. And some of the ancient... Uh, cultures that came up near the Ural Mountains, Ukraine, uh, Romania, those places, um, that, you know, once they spread out, they began to interject themselves and to also lead in advancement the various peoples, cultures, and civilizations that they encountered when they spread out from the destruction of Atlantis. And it is also said, according to the text, that there were two factions, the Brotherhood of Darkness and also the Sons of Light. And that these two factions were even in contention during the Atlantean age, or Zeptepe, the prior times that there was heated contention between them going back into the very distant annals of history and uh, demagogic and fallen angelic history. And so this is a part of the story that most people are not aware of and not taking into account when they try to understand the fullness of what is the ancient mythological record of how the fallen angels and the pre-Adamic peoples also tie into the story of what are the, the modern age, the last 6,000 years which span the generations of Adam and Cain, and that these two particular bloodlines make up the, the dominant theme of the story of who we are, where we are, and why we are here. Uh, but of course, unless you understand the origins 
of how the fallen angels and the war in heaven and the earth becoming without form and void, the destruction that we see of places like Pumapunku, the mythology of Atlantis, uh, the destruction of this mother culture, uh, the diaspora as related to in James Churchill's work with the peoples of Mu. If you don't understand how all these things unify in underlying truth, well, then it's hard to make sense of uh, just the, the different aspects of it individualized and not taking into account the full summaz summaz summarization of what is the fullness of the story, the bigger picture, so to speak. And so, and so anyways, um, those are some of the things that I speak about in the work that I do with regard to the prior times, the Zeptepe, and it's something that has been a portion of my work ever since the release of my fourth book, Lucifer, Father of Cain, which unifies an understanding the how the fallen angels in the war in heaven relates to what is the first and second incursion of the angels, the first being the casting down of Lucifer and the one-third of the angels of the Most High, the seraphic angels, the seraphim, which rebelling with Lucifer were exiled here in ancient times to this part of the world and to the earth from the upper heavens. And um, it was th when they were cast down, they <clears throat> basically led astray the pre Adamic peoples that they encountered um, and that they tried to make a slave race of these p p particular ancient hominids, which is the exact story that is related in the Sumerian mythology, which you know, when you have a story of ancient fallen angelic beings trying to enslave uh, the ancient races that were here upon the plane of the earth, how in any manner you could think them to be benevolent or how you could consider them to be your god or your gods it is really just beyond me. I mean, that's how led astray and deceived the people of this generation and the people of the world are. Because we have to remember that they demanded blood, victim, and child sacrifice in the establishment of the worship that they instituted worldwide which is why the most high you know brought judgment against them being the only true god um and you know the trinity in three as one the father the son and the mother um but yet you know again because people don't understand the fullness of the story they believe that the Sumerians predated uh, as far as the biblical narrative, which that is also false and confirmation of that can be gleaned in studying who the Thracian peoples are uh, and how they were very ancient Christians who also knew the truth of the coming of the Messiah, uh, Yeshua being born of a virgin that he would you know, um, that he would enter into the flesh at a certain time in a certain place, which is the two-part series that I'm working on right now. The book, book one, we, which we just released three or four days ago, is called The Testament of the Patriarchs and the Prophets. 
And the reason I compiled this series of ancient testaments together is because they affirm, beginning with Adam, in the story, the testament of Adam, he relates how when he was cast out, exiled from paradise, how even then he was given a prophecy from the word, the logos, the memra of the most high God, the only begotten son, that he was told then that Yeshua would enter into the flesh 5,500 years after his exile from paradise. And that in doing so, he would redeem Adam and his ancestors who would be bound in Sheol and locked away until his death on the cross and then descending into Sheol, breaking open the gates of iron and the doors of brass and then freeing them would restore them to their former estate, which is exactly what happened <clears throat> when you know the full story of Christ and when he was away from his body. But anyways, um, and so uh, welcome everybody. It's good to see you, especially you see Joy in the the chat comment and Stephanie and Zippy and Olive and Gina and Shane. Good to see you, brother, and um, everybody else there in the chat room. Uh, I appreciate all of you. Laurel, thanks for always um, joining in the conversation and listening. I did receive a, <clears throat> excuse me, a message from Bill, and so he will be joining us in about 15 minutes. And so probably after the first break, we'll bring him on and then we'll pick up the story as far as the series on the tuning fork. And, but anyways, um, I, I wanted to further cover the, the reason that I compiled the Testaments of the Patriarchs and the Prophets was to bring forth the stories as they were passed down from Adam to his son, Seth, and then on and forward um, to his children and to the generations up until the time of Enoch, who also wrote these things down and pass them on even in the story the the first book of Enoch the story the prophecies of the coming of the elect one the son of man Yeshua Christ as revealed within those particular uh, that particular book and as much as certain factions of the seed of Cain try to discredit and also to lead astray people the book of Enoch is dated back to the third century BC and so the stories contained within them about the coming of the elect one and how he would be born of a virgin that he would enter into the flesh in order to rectify the fall and that in his second coming he would separate the harvest the wheat and the tares, the goat and the sheep, the wise from the foolish virgins, that the story which you know is in every way told within the Old and the New Testament, even in parable form by Christ in Matthew 13 on the parable of the kingdom, the parable of the wheat and the tares, the parable of the, the seed, um, all these things. It's the same story that Enoch also reveals in First Enoch. And so there's no denying that these accounts of the coming of Christ are prophetic and were scripted, penned hundreds of years 
thousands probably even before his incarnation in the flesh form. And so in the second book, which is the companion book to the Testaments of the Patriarchs and the Prophets, I am sharing and extracting many prophecies, ancient scriptures about two specific prophecies as revealed the first in the first book of Adam and Eve, which, as I had mentioned, is the story of the 5,500 years and how Christ would come into the flesh after this particular time had passed in order to redeem Adam and his righteous descendants. And how this was fulfilled when he went down into Sheol and then leading Adam and his ancestors out, took them up into paradise at the third heaven and then giving them over to Michael the archangel they were baptized in the Archerosian lake and then allowed then to eat from the tree of life and to enter into the city of God New Jerusalem and it is there that they await us even now but that upon arrival there they encountered the thief on the cross, which died to the right hand of Christ. And he was told to go into paradise and to await the coming of Adam and Christ and the other descendants. And upon their arrival, he told his story of, you know, basically being a criminal and how he was forgiven and was allowed entrance into paradise. And they then encountered Enoch and Elijah that because they had not ever died the death of man but are being preserved to be the two witnesses of Revelation 11 who will come at the end of days and then be killed by the Antichrist in the streets of Jerusalem where their bodies will lay for three and a half days that that will be when they succumb to death because everybody dies once and then judgment as is revealed in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 you can study it for yourself but anyways and so that is the first prophecy that I share and then numerous numerous texts that I share from and bring forth which all have connections to the prophecy as contained and as shared by Adam and repeated and prized by the the children of Adam going from Seth to Enoch to Noah to Shem to Abraham to Isaac, to Jacob, who became Israel, to the 12 tribes and the patriarchs, as revealed in the testament of the 12 patriarchs, and then on and on and on. The Psalms of Solomon, the Odes of Solomon, the uh, ascension of Isaiah, the stories of you know, um, Isaiah in the Old Testament, there are so many prophecies and it's because people don't read the extra biblical material that the Jews even now uh, predominantly don't accept Christ as the fulfillment of their scriptures. And as I will show in this particular text, in this particular book, that tying together all the loose ends and reading the extra biblical material and studying them in the manner that I do, it is undeniable that Christ, Yeshua, is the fulfillment of the prophecy that was given to Adam as well as the prophecy which the second one I cover in great detail is the prophecy found in Genesis 
on the enmity between the seed lines and how the seed of the woman would crush the head of the seed of the serpent at the same time that the seed of the serpent was nipping at the heel of the seed of the woman. Which for those that know and follow my work, I've revealed this many times, written about it and covered it in great detail in many radio broadcasts, that that was actually when Yeshua being crucified on the cross, that Daniel had a thousand years prior buried the skull of Goliath after beheading him with his own sword and taking his skull as prize so that he could show to the the Israelite citizens, the people of Jerusalem, that he had indeed, with the help of the Most High God, slaughtered the Philistine champion. And so he paraded his skull around to prove, to verify his account. And so they made songs up about him to celebrate this act. And this is, you know, everybody knows the story of David and Goliath. That's the one story about giants that everybody knows about. When the theme of the enmity, the war between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent uh, is most certainly centered upon the war of the Israelites as the seed of promise with the hybrid children of Cain and specifically with those men of renown which were born of the copulation of the watchers with the daughters of Cain. And so, and everybody, you know, uh, a lot of researchers will tie, they will, they will um, acknowledge that there is a serpent seed line here on the earth, but they won't take it back to Genesis 3 where this prophecy originates. Because I assure you in studying the ancient Hebrew language and taking it back to the Strongs, that it, in my opinion, it's undeniable that it was Eve's beguilement by the serpent and her eating and taking part in the consumption of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that resulted in her taking on flesh form so that she could be seduced by the serpent and impregnated with the firstborn son of the devil, Cain, who was of that wicked one, that the tares are the children of the wicked one, the enemy which snuck into the garden, that it was Genesis 3 and the story of her temptation and her beguilement which led to the birth of the twins, the fraternal twins, and that Adam's eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil resulted in the birth of Abel which is why we see in the Genesis 3.15 account that there would be enmity between these two bloodlines, that Abel would be the seed of the woman and Cain the seed of the serpent. And because he murdered his half-brother, which is why it says in, you know, in, in John 8 and also Matthew uh, and Luke, that the Pharisees and their bloodline, their fathers, that they were the killers of the prophets, going from Abel to Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, who was the cousin of Yeshua, born six months prior to him. 
Mary's cousin Elizabeth that they conceived and brought forth their children six months apart from one another. And so anyways, in this new book that I am working on and will be publishing hopefully within a couple weeks, if you read it and you study it in the manner that I have written it to be understood, it's undeniable that Christ was the fulfillment of all of these prophecies as laid out over myriads of texts and hundreds of passages which date back thousands of years over the course of all of the generations of Adam, even to the time of his own exile and going back to the many manuscripts which comprise the body of work called the, um, the, the history and the testaments, the life of Adam and Eve, which, you know, there's the Hebrew text, uh, the story of Adam and Eve. Um, there's the Gregorian or the Georgian, I mean, sorry, not Gregorian, the Georgian manuscript on the life of Adam and Eve. There's the Latin, the Vitae, et Atta, and Ua. There's the Thracian account. There's the penitence of Adam, the Coptic, um, the Greek. I mean, the apocalypse of Moses. All of these are stories of the ancient lives of Adam and Eve. And many of them contain the prophecy that Adam was given of how Christ would take on form. He would enter into the flesh. And as the son, the Logos, the Memra of the Most High God, that he would die on the cross and in dying, being crucified, would defeat death and being resurrected to life resurrect Adam and his righteous descendants. And so, um, in my opinion, when you read it in its fullness, you're just going to be blown away by all of the prophecies that comprise this story, this particular tale. And again, because most people are not familiar with the extra biblical manuscripts, they're not even aware of these many prophecies as foreshadowed, as prophetically uttered in foresight in all of these manuscripts. And even in the canonical material, even in just the, the King James, the Old Testament, the stories of Isaiah and the minor prophets, Micah and uh, Hosea and others, there's 300 plus prophecies which relate to the birth of the Messiah, that he would be of the tribe of Judah, born in and near the town of Bethlehem. His mother would be of the royal line and also his adopted father, even though we know that it is God that is his real father, but even his adopted father, Joseph, would be of the line, as would Mary, of David, that they would be considered royalty, priests and kings and princesses. And all of this is affirmed as well in the manuscripts. Uh, one other thing, I would also say that um, I, I share and I have compiled a book on the infancy, the early childhood, and the lost years of Christ. And I would ask people to read those themselves. They're freely available online. All you have to do is look up the infancy gospels 
as related by Didymus Thomas, his half brother, his step brother, and also Jew James. Um, and all of those stories, as I said, are freely available. But if you want them all together in book form, we have released those as well through Sacred Word Publishing. Dot net. And there are many dozens of manuscripts which compile this body of work as well. And there was another text called the Gospel of Gamaliel on the, the um, the, the Virgin Mother. Oh, it's called the Gospel of Gamaliel, the Lament of the Virgin, and also the Martyrdom of Pilate. And this story is about the Passion of Christ. It's about 100 pages long, and it details in greater exposition the story of the Passion and its connections to the martyrdom of Pilate and the lamentation and also to the to the death of the Virgin Mary and how she was taken care of by by John. Um, I mean, this is a story that most people do not know about either. And reading it and the the infancy gospels together, it will give you a greater understanding of the story of the passion of Christ than any other, I mean, much more so than the three books, the gospels, even though, you know, they give us a great amount of information on the story of Shua and his passion, his crucifixion, and also his resurrection. But nothing like what is contained in the infancy gospels and the gospel of Gamaliel. And for those that don't know, Gamaliel was the brother of Nicodemus, which the story, the gospel of Nicodemus, the past, and also his sent into hell, Sheol, to free Adam and his righteous descendants. But anyways, being brothers, they were part of the the Pharisee priesthood, which when they started seeking to conspire the murder of Yeshua, they became believers. And they were witnesses for him that he did not deserve to be punished and to be crucified by Pilate. And, and in fact, Nicodemus and Gamaliel were two of the witnesses which convinced Pilate of Yeshua's innocence, along with Joseph of Arimathea, his uncle, who was also very close to the uh, to the Pharisee Sanhedrin, uh, the church, the temple authority back in those days. And so I do recommend that people check all those out. But anyways, as I said, you can find them at www.sacredwordpublishing.net. My good friend Carol Austin is the webmaster there. And if you have any questions for me on any of the text, that certainly you can... Um, you can go to the website and you re you can relate to her and ask her any question because I am doing once a month now we are doing question and answer and sharing commentary from that particular website. But just to give you an idea, because I know many of you probably have not ever even been to the website and don't have any understanding as to the many books that we have published on the extra biblical manuscripts. 
nor do you have any understanding that just so you know we publish them in 14 point font so they are very much larger in font and very much easier to see and that it's a lot easier to read and to study um and so just to give you an idea of some of the books that we publish the writings of abraham as i said the testaments of the patriarchs and the prophets the chronicles of jeremiah uh, the flat earth archival proofs of william carpenter the 1611 king james apocrypha the medieval irish apocrypha yahweh's unique timepiece revealed king's the throne the apocryphal texts of the Maccabean Wars, which includes Maccabees 1 through 8, which most people are only familiar with 4. And a historical treatise on the travels of Noah into Europe. The Book of Jasher, the Thracian script decoded 3. The Gospel of Gamaliel, the Lament of the Virgin and the Martyrdom of Pilate. Yahushua Christ, the Infancy, Childhood, and Lost Years, the Book of Jubilees, the Great Commission Three, the Apocalypses, the Great Commission Two, the Acts and the Gospels of the Apostles, uh, the Great Commission One, the Acts and the Gospels of the Apostles, which for those that don't know, you know, there's one book of Acts in our Bible, but there are literally dozens of manuscripts about the the work the great commission uh, of the apostles that went out two by two to different parts of the world to to do the work of spreading the gospel and the places and the peoples and things that they encountered and overcame the parables of joy the book of the bee the global versus the flat earth debate Paradise, Sides of the North, and the Mount of the Congregation, the Earth Stands Fast, Beguiled Eden to Armageddon, Books 1 through 3, The Antichrist, the Cloned Image of Jesus Christ, with those, which those books are my, by my friend, Dr. Joy Pugh. And I do ask that people pray for her as well, uh, that she's still having a very difficult time. Uh, her husband taking the flu vaccine a number of years ago uh, his body began shutting down on him and he's mostly paralyzed now with Gillian Beret and so please do pray for them Ophelia Tria which is about serpent worship 50 reason Copernicus or the Bible the legends of the Jews books one through four my son's book a prodigal biography the Illuminati Protocols and Secret Covenant, the Collected Works of Enoch the Prophet, which contains so many more texts on the Book of Enoch that you know most people, again, are not familiar with. Uh, just to name a few, the you know the Dead Sea fragments the of the Book One, the Manic Manachian. Book of the Giants, the Midrash of Semyaza and Azazel, the Keber Nagas, chapter 100, the Armenian vision of Enoch, the Just, the Hebrew third book of Enoch, um, the Slavonic, the tablets of Enoch. I mean, so many more, of course, than the, you know, the Lawrence translation of the Book of the Secrets of Enoch and the R.H. Charles translation of the Book of Enoch. There's also um, the recent Greek 2005 discovery of the account of Enoch the prophet. Uh, all these different texts that, again, they've all been compiled into one book, the collected works of Enoch. And, you know, instead of having to buy a bunch of them, which most of them don't even have these other unfamiliar and obscure Enochian texts, you can get it all together in one book, 400 and some plus pages 
on the collected works of Enoch the Prophet in both soft and hardback, mind you, which the hardbacks are really beautiful. But anyways, uh, the forgotten Edenic books of Adam and Eve, the uh, worship of the serpent, the great contest one and two, the cave of treasures, which I know we're almost to break, so hit me up when we go to break because I'm not hearing anything anymore. Is the Earth a Globe, Firmament, Vaulted Dome of the Earth? My book, Skyfall and Sons of God, are, we still are selling a few copies there, just so you know. Um, but we only have very few, so I know they're selling on Amazon for in excess of $100 a piece, uh, but we're selling them for a lot cheaper, 40 and $60 for the hardback version on our website. So, you know, get them while you can because we have less than 10 copies now. Uh, the Aramaic and Palestinian Targums Awaken to the New World Order, A Different Way of Being, uh, some of the Spanish translations of my book. We have posters on site, all of that. And so, you know, T-shirts on the firmament. So check it out. And there's always some kind of discount if you look at the very top of the, the website. But anyway, so keep an eye out for the, the Testament of the Patriarchs the, and the Prophets, which is already released, and soon becoming the Ancient Prophecies of Christ, which I guarantee you will blow your mind. I think we've got just a couple minutes before break, so I'll mention again that this evening after this, this show here on Momentary Zen, which Bill McGregor will be joining us in the next segment for discussion on the ongoing series that we're doing, uh, the tuning for But I will be on this tonight, midnight to 2 a.m., which I'm going to have to drink some. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to second hour. Thank you so much, uh, Gina, Stephanie, and everybody. Carol, Olive, we appreciate you uh, letting us know. Uh, really, really greatly appreciative to all of you for tuning in and helping us stay on uh, and to keep up with all the, the commercial breaks and everything. Bill, are you there, brother? Yes, sir, I'm here. All right, and I am to remind you that we made it to Luke, and so we are three <laughs> books in uh, to the New Testament, and so... I, I'm guessing it'd probably take us maybe two more programs, a, a full broadcast, to make it through, and then you have a lot of work to do, my friend, in converting uh, them. Up. It, and it will get done. I'm excited about it. You, you've seen some of them already, but uh, I'm not finished. So yes, it's going to be I very, have. very good. And I did upload to one of my YouTube accounts already the first one that you sent me, and so I'll be uploading to the other account the the first one as well soon but hopefully we'll be able to get them all um you know somewhere in line uh so that people can go one to the other to the other to the other and catch the yeah. fullness of I'll, the account I'll organize them very nicely okay great brother well let me go ahead and turn it back over to you uh if you would introduce your book what it's about your website contact information and then we'll get back into this series. Yes, we will do. What I'm uh, going to introduce here, here I, I appreciate being on the program, by the way. Thank you very much for having me on. My name is Bill McGregor. I'm the author of the Tuning Fork book. I'm on Facebook Live as well. For those that uh, want to go on Facebook Live and, and watch on my Facebook channel as well. As um, the Tuning Fork is a is an expose of a well-known phenomenon that is in the Bible. It's nothing new, certainly nothing I discovered or, or found out about. Uh, but it, it's the Isaiah miniature Bible phenomenon. Uh, what that is, is for those that don't know, uh, that, that the, 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 the Bible, the canonical Bible in the King James Version has 66 books. 
and not including the Apocrypha, which were included in the original King James for, for historical purposes only, and um, such as it is. But 66 books of the Bible are the, con- are the canon of Scripture, as the King James translators, and, uh, and, and the book of Isaiah, which, of course, is uh, near the middle of the Bible. Uh, it has 66 chapters, and then people have often conjectured that maybe there's a, a cross-referencing uh, referen- uh, correlation to the 66 books of the Bible, uh, re- uh, kind of mirrored in the 66 chapters of Isaiah. And a few uh, here and there have found some. But what we decided to do 20 years ago is to begin to compile all of them. And for the last 20 years, we've done that, and we've now produced a book which, which we titled The Tuning Fork. Um, and uh, what we've done is we've taken each of the chapters of Isaiah and we've connected them by way of cross-referencing links to the um, co- to the respective book of the Bible as they go through the canonical order. And uh, when I first started doing this study, Zen, I thought I was just doing an interesting Bible study that was a cute uh, look at an at a, at a interesting literary phenomenon. But... Uh, as I went along, I found out and realized that I had entered a sacred literary chamber. In fact, that I had entered a, a, a supernatural zone zone that, that few had ever entered. And, and as much as we've discovered that God has miracu- miraculously placed in the Bible uh, <clears throat> a, a tuning fork uh, to for us to verify the the Bible as being a a miraculous book, absolutely, and B, verifying which of the modern-day English versions are the ones, or the one, that he has sanctioned. And uh, be- because what, what I realized, and what, what we what dawned on me halfway through, is that Isaiah did all this pre-writing of the Bible when most of the authors were not born yet. And uh, and you'll see as we go through this that, that the, the, the connections are absolutely irrefutable. They, they, they cannot be uh, uh, cast aside as being simply uh, contrived or coincidental because there's just so many of them and, and many, many of them are, are astoundingly miraculous. Uh, and so as we go through this, I think your listeners are going to discover as we have uh, as we go along that this is this is probably the most important extra biblical discovery of all time. And it's not extra biblical; it's it's intra biblical. It's in the Bible, to, as far as a discovery to prove that the Bible is the Word of God, irrefutably so. And so that, that's what the tuning fork is. It's it's an expose. We were explaining the significance of this miracle, and we're exposing the miracle in great detail. And so what Zen and I are doing is we're going through a. Uh, chapter five of the book, which is the meat and potatoes of the book, and it goes through. Chapter five is is the march through the Bible, chapter by chapter of Isaiah and book by book of of the Bible, and showing those comparisons so that the reader can be convinced that the the Bible is absolutely on uh, open and shut case the word of God, and specifically that the King James Bible is God's word for the English-speaking people. You can get your copy. It is shipping currently at um, at thetuningfork.com. Uh, That's uh, the website, thetuningfork.com, and uh, the book is for order uh, for sale there for those that wish to order, and thank you for having me on. Uh, it's our great pleasure, and uh, looking forward to, you know, the continued dialogue, and I do think uh, in my opinion, this work is important and it is relevant, especially for this, the final generation, the fig tree generation, exactly. that there's so many that are being led astray and that do not believe or have intimate relationship with the Most High God, um, believe, you know, in science and evolution and that the Earth is a, one of nine planets spinning in orbit around the sun and all of these different uh, things and so greatly right. diluted and there is much deception and so this this will help to clarify some of those things and so yeah if you would bill let's let's get into it we you know only have this second hour so yes and uh that's uh we, we we're going to start in the book of luke thank you for taking notes for me zen i'm uh, i got a lot going on and you did that for me i appreciate it so we, right. we've gone with zen through the books of the bible and we're now currently comparing the book of luke uh, with Isaiah chapter 42. And again, this is this is to demonstrate the miraculous nature of the writing of Isaiah corresponding to the books of the Bible when most of those books had not been written. So understand that the authors that we're comparing notes with never could have met each other. They were separated by centuries and centuries. Uh, let, let, let's go through this now and start with Luke. Isaiah 
to. Now we are using highlights because. It's oh, hey, Bill, talk a little bit slower. All right. Uh, because when you get excited, your your mic goes intermittent, and so I want people to be able to hear you clear. So just a little bit slower. All right, that's my fault for being an ex auctioneer, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so as you go through the book, when you read it, if you do get a copy of it, you'll see. And I'm showing on Facebook Live. Uh, and, and you'll see this later on Zen's uh, videos as well that I'll be providing him. We're going to be providing this this by way of a document camera. So as I'm going through the book, I'm going to be doing highlighting, and you'll be able to see the actual book on the videos that, that Zen will be producing on his channel. But for, for for now, Facebook Live, we're showing the pages, and you can see that it's just it's not just a book. It's actually a it's actually a, a roadmap through the Bible with lots of notes and icons uh, in the margins to show you. How to how to how to read it and how to get the, the what, what's going on there. It's an action book, not just a read. And uh, so you'll you'll see as you go along. So um so I'm in book of Luke, and uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the highlights. And uh, uh, so uh, all right now let me just get my pen to make sure I'm all organized here and I'm ready to go. Okay, so in the book of Luke, the first verse of Isaiah chapter 42. So if you are if you have a Bible open, this makes the job even easier for you to follow along. Isaiah chapter 42 is a famous and beloved messianic passage. Here he cites two central factors of the ministry of the Messiah to come. And uh, Isaiah 42, 1, I read, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. So the, the, the theme there of that verse is that the Messiah is coming, the spirit's going to be upon him, and he's going to be uh, uh, focusing on bringing the message of God to the Gentiles. And, uh, and now, of course, we understand that the book of Luke uh, is one of the four Gospels, and the emphasis of each Gospel is different. The, the, the emphasis are, are to different audiences, each of the four Gospels, and the book of Luke is, is the Gospel that was written to the Gentiles. And, of course, Isaiah 41, 42, verse 1 tells us that that would be the case. And Luke, Luke even enunciates that in his Gospel, where he says in Luke chapter 2, verse 32, at the beginning of the verse, he says that Christ came as a light to lighten the Gentiles. Uh, in fact, that is a quote from, a loose quote from Isaiah 42, 1. So we're definitely connected here right out of the gate in the very first verse of Isaiah chapter 42. And then, of course, Isaiah said in that same verse that not only would he go to the Gentiles, but that the Spirit of God would be upon him, and that's recorded again in Luke chapter 3, verse 22. It says, The Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, the same wording, the spirit being upon him, same exact wording that was that was given there. And again, when we read Isaiah 42, the chapter is full of references to the going of the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, I'll read some of them. 42 verse 1, of course, he shall bring judgment to the Gentiles. 42 4 says the isles shall wait for his law, the isles being the islands. That is a reference to the distant nations of the lands of the world. And, uh, and the third is to give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. That's 42 verse 6. So obviously it's abundant in the book of Isaiah that uh, that the, the Messiah that was to come, for Isaiah is a future uh, a Messiah, that Messiah would come and be for the Gentiles. And that is, of course, Dr. Luke's intent in writing the gospel. Now here's a really powerful one as we go into the meat of the book of Luke. I'll give you a couple more here. Jesus' first recorded sermon in Luke's gospel, he preached in his home synagogue at Nazareth. So in the book of Luke, his first sermon, he preached at his hometown in the synagogue. As one might expect, he quotes scripture to introduce himself and his ministry. Here's Jesus' first sermon. He's a, he's a brand new preacher right off the press. And his first sermon. Now, the best verse to use in the entire Old Testament for this introduction would have been Isaiah 61, verse 1. And that's exactly the verse that Jesus used as his sermon text. Now, notice that Isaiah 61 is not Isaiah 42. So it, at first glance, it would appear that there's maybe Jesus kind of missed the ball here and forgot about the tuning fork phenomenon and, and was not in compliance. Ah, wait, wait. Jesus was forced to use this verse for pragmatic reasons because perhaps it is the, the sermon text, is it is the best verse in all of the Old Testament to summarize the ministry of the Messiah. So, so Jesus should have used that verse because it was the best one. But wait, 
Well, let me first read you Isaiah 61, verse 1, understanding that we're not in the we're, we're not compliant to the tuning fork phenomenon. But here's Jesus preaching his first sermon in his synagogue, home synagogue in Nazareth. And here's his verse that he quotes from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Now, notwithstanding, Jesus made the right choice because this is the best verse to do the job, of course. But wait, there is a small discrepancy in Jesus' reading of this passage. Read it carefully now in Luke. So Jesus, now we're in Luke, and we're, we're going to read Jesus' quote of Isaiah 61 in announcing his ministry publicly. Now let's follow this carefully because amazing element here. Luke 4, verse 18, we are in. So here's Jesus quoting Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. Come on, pause. Now that is the end of Isaiah's 61 element of the quote. But now Jesus goes on as if it was the same passage. And let's read the rest of his quote and be amazed at this Zen. This is a, a shock. Here we go, and now we continue. Pause button. We just push the pause button again. We're going to proceed. And recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised. Now that is Luke 4.18. Jesus quoting Isaiah 61. And as if it was the same passage. Now remember Jesus, he's the author of the Bible. So he has every right to, to, to mash verses together and make them new scripture. Yeah, we understand that, right? He's the author of the Bible. He can do what he wants with Isaiah. Guess where he got the second half of his sermon text from? He chose Isaiah 61 because that is the best rendition for his ministry. But it was incomplete. He had to go elsewhere in the book of Isaiah to finish a complete description of his ministry. And can you guess where he found that quote to, to put those two together? Yes, you heard me right. Isaiah 61. Here... Isaiah 60, oh, sorry, Isaiah, <laughs> Isaiah 42, because Isaiah 61 has nothing to say about the blind nor the bruised. So where was he getting it? He was getting it from Isaiah 42 in compliance with the tuning fork phenomenon. So we have a hybrid quote mixing Isaiah 61 and Isaiah 42. Here's Isaiah 42, ready? Verse three, a bruised reed shall he not break. There's our bruised. He came to them that are bruised. The next quote, Isaiah 42, verse 7, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and then that sit in darkness out of the prison house. That is exactly the quote. So Jesus hybrid quoted Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 61 in compliance with the Isaiah miniature phenomenon called the tuning fork. He rightly used that and, and put it together. He So the Bible says, and Mark said, he has done all things well. And truly, Jesus did all things well. Now, <clears throat> so mighty was the work of Christ, as recorded in the book of Luke, that one might point, that one might, uh, that at one point, the rocks were on the verge of singing out. So we're on a new idea now. And uh, that is that Jesus said in Luke chapter 19, verse 40, if you recall, when he entered triumphantly into Jerusalem, he was riding on, the, on a donkey, and um, and the Pharisees told him to tell his worshipers to shut up, because they were calling him God. They were saying he was Messiah, and they didn't believe that, and they were insulted that the, these people were saying that. So Jesus said to them, if I tell you that if these, these people specifically, should hold their peace, these are the people that were shouting, Hosanna to the Lord God Almighty, in the highest, he said, if these people should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Goodness sakes, what a powerful statement that is, right, Zen? Well, Absolutely. guess what? Well, guess what? <laughs> Isaiah 42, verse 11, shows us the same phenomenon in a cryptid context. Now, watch this. Here's Isaiah 42, verse 11, the last half of the verse. Let the inhabitants of the rock sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. So it's a cryptid context. But here we have the word rock singing, although it's not actually the rock singing, it's the, the inhabitants, but it says rock sing and let them shout. 
So in, in, encrypted in an alternate context, we have the only other time in the Bible where rocks are going to sing and shout. And it's Isaiah 42, verse 11. Exactly in tune in the tuning fork phenomenon. So now next, watch what the stones, watch and marvel that the stones are thus included. The stones were on the verge of singing out, as Jesus said, because the people in Jesus' day were blind and deaf. Now that tells us the tuning fork uh, uh, connection to the blind and deaf we read earlier. So Luke chapter 8, verse 10 says, when Jesus was speaking the parables, he explained why he spoke in parables and hide and sort of covered his 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 teaching so that only certain people would understand. And he explains that in Luke 8:10, at the end of the verse, he says, But to others he spoke in parables that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not hear. So when 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 Jesus identifies this sad malaise of his day. He is, an, is anyone surprised that Jesus was quoting Isaiah 42 when he said that? Isaiah 42, verse 20, that seeing many things, but thou observest not, opening the ears, but he heareth not. So Jesus said that and quoted Isaiah 42 when he did it. So we're just marching through this and seeing miracle after miracle uh, that, that, that is just mind-blowing. Now, here's another one. We're still in Luke. This will be our last one for Luke. It seems that Isaiah had the, the same problem with his parishioners, listening and not understanding. And so uh, let's read about Isaiah having this same problem. An example in Isaiah 42, verse 22, we learn of a character that, that, in that a character in Isaiah's church, in his audience, that was robbing and spoiling and taking prey from the people, and no one seemed to have the courage to confront the fellow and tell him to restore what he had stolen as the law commanded thieves and hucksters were to do in Leviticus chapter 6, verse 4, where Moses also used the word restore. He said that thieves are to restore what, what they've stolen. And, and so Isaiah had people that were stealing. I'll read it to you, but verse 42, verse 22, chapter 42, verse 22, Isaiah. He said this, but this people, this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes. They are hidden prison houses. For they are a prey, and none delivereth, for a spoil, and none saith, Restore. So Isaiah is saying that his people are being robbed and stolen from, and nobody's telling the thief to restore what they stole. See? So this is a problem that Isaiah in Isaiah 42. However, it was not all that bad with Jesus' crowd later on. At least one charlatan that was engaged in the very same monkey business like like Isaiah's monkey business characters were taught he preached to, at least one of Jesus' thieves restored <laughs> and amended his ways what, that, that, regarding that which was stolen. And you will only find this story in one of the Gospels. How many know we're talking about the story of Zacchaeus, right? So Jesus had a character in his crowd that was also robbing the people and not restoring. And when Jesus preached, the guy repented. And I, in Luke 19... He follows the Mosaic law to restore. Verse 8, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore. The word restore is specifically used. I restore him fourfold. So Isaiah said, None saith restore in my church. But in Jesus' church, at least he found one guy that, would, that was stealing and was willing to restore using the same word. Now, Zen, for those that don't know the, the, the way the Tuning Fork book works, is that I have at the back of the book a, a, a chart called the Tuning Fork Compliance Chart. And, uh, and what that chart does is that chart takes some of the, the some of these Tuning Fork phenomena are what I call word choice sensitive. So in other words, in this example we just read about this word restore, um, that is a word choice sensitive Tuning Fork connection. Because if Isaiah, if the King James translators did not translate restore in Isaiah 42, and, and when they came to Luke, well, but Zacchaeus using the same word restore so that the, the English connection would be congruent in the, even in the English. We call that a word choice sensitive tuning for compliance uh, uh, element. And so what I've done is I've taken at the back of the book, I've created what I call the tuning for compliance chart. A hundred, there, there are uh, 639 tuning fork connections isolated in, this, in my book. Of those 629, 
134 of them are, are word choice sensitive. This is one of them. So what I do is I, I, I go in the margin and I show the reader in the margin that there's a little icon there. If you can see it on Facebook, there's a little tuning fork icon and it says 65 above it. So what you do is you go to the back of the book and you look up uh, line 65 where you'll see the King James rendition of those two passages in, in, in number 65. And here it is here for those that are on Facebook. You'll see it on Zen's program later. 65 shows you the comparison. So what, what happens is, is that the King James Version, it uses the word restore and the word restore in both of our passages at hand. The, the, it compares the NIV version of the Bible, the New International Version, and the New International Version uses the word pay back in Isaiah. And for Zacchaeus, it says send them back. Why? I have no idea. But it's not compliant at all. Now, uh, we go then to the ESV, and the ESV, in fairness, uses the word restore and the word restore. So the ESV, in this case, is actually compliant. So I'm, 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 not, I'm not dishonest, at least, when the other versions are compliant. Rarely, uh, the ESV happens to be compliant in that example. And then the, uh, the New King James is also compliant. So the, the, the New King James and the ESV are compliant, as is the King James, but the NIV is way out to lunch. And, and so... Just for, for our readers' benefit, the King James Version is compliant every time, and the other versions are non-compliant either all of the time or most of the time, rare exception. So that's a, an interesting bonus uh, at the back of the book. Okay, so now we've, we're done with the book of Luke. All right? Now, uh, unless there's any questions or comments, we're going to plow into the book of John. Now, John, man, this this one's something. This, this is, this is mind-boggling. One of my favorite books. I keep saying that, but they're always mind-boggling. But this one, this one's, this one's, oh. okay, I'll start right here. When you begin to read Isaiah 43, you'll find from the first few verses that there are several series connections to the book of John. In other words, the connections are, are in sequence. There's a sequence of them. Those connections, these connections read like a title deed of ownership. In this one verse, there is one phrase after another in which the Lord restates his right of ownership over us, if you're a Christian. And that being, of course, the people in the New Testament era. Each of these statements of ownership is reconfirmed in the book of John. So we will start with verse 1 of Isaiah 43. So let's start at Isaiah 43, verse 1. Here's what it says. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by name, Thou art mine. Now, we have a couple of phrases here that are critical. The basis for the first statement of ownership in that verse is the fact that he created us. So God says in Isaiah 43, verse 1, is that I've got four statements that prove the title deed of ownership that I have over my people in the New, in the New Testament era, of course, to come. And that is first that he created us. Now, let's turn to John. Does it say anywhere that Jesus created us? Why, well, it sure does. John 1, verse 2. <laughs> John 1, verse 2 says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So we have that confirmed in the book of John, that Jesus created us. The second thing Isaiah said in that verse is, I have redeemed thee. So I own you, God says, because number one, I created you, and number two, because I have redeemed you. What does John say about that? Ah, the next title deed of ownership is redemption, where John 19, verse 30, we have the great account of the completion of the redemption of our souls on the cross in 1930, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. There we have the completion of the purchase. Tetelestai, right? That's the word he's said in Aramaic. It is paid in full. It's finished. The work on the cross, of the work of redemption is completed at the work, on the work of the cross. The second, the third title ownership of Isaiah 43, I have called thee by name, Isaiah said in that same verse. <coughs> what does John say about that? <laughs> John 10, verse 3, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name. So God owns you, Isaiah said, because I created you, and, I, and John confirms that. God owns you because I have redeemed you, and John confirms that. And God owns you because I've called you by name, and John confirms that too. And then the fourth and last one he said in that verse, thou art mine. Well, what does John say about that? <laughs> John chapter 10, verse 29 says, my father which gave 
them, me. That's Jesus speaking about his sheep. So you see, John confirms the ownership title deed. Now, what good is a title deed without a seal to be sure that it cannot be lost? There can be no safer, more secure seal than to be sealed in the hand of the Father. That's why John finishes the above verse where, where he gave them to me with this next phrase. You ready for this? John 10, 29. And no, so he says in verse, the beginning of the verse, my father, which gave them to me, and then the end of the verse says, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. So if you're a child of God, you're one of God's sheep. He's called you by name. He, you are his, you are in the father's hands. Now, what did I, to wrap this up in like a beautiful bow tie, what did John say about being in the Father's hand? Or sorry, Isaiah, rather. Isaiah 43, verse 13, he said, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Wow. So we've got some mighty powerful stuff here that's beautiful and connected in God's miraculous tuning fork phenomenon. Now, the best is yet to be about John. This 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 one could be the most powerful in the whole phenomenon. Are you ready for this? While we are on the topic of being Jesus being the I am. Remember he Jesus said I am and the, yes. Jehovah said I am to Moses in the burning bush, okay? Now watch this. The references in these two writings, Isaiah 43 and the book of John are startling beyond belief. The Gospel of John is famous for announcing the seven I am's, which Jesus attributed to himself. I'll read them for you. Here is the seven I am's famously recorded in the book of John. John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. John 10, verse 7, Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep. John 10, verse 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And finally, John 15, verse 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine. So Jesus in, in John 15 is recorded as referring to himself as I am seven times. Now, <laughs> Zen, I hope you're sitting down. Guess how many times the Lord God referred to himself as I am in Isaiah chapter 43. Seven. I like to suggest that it's seven times. <laughs> seven times God says I am. I'll read them for you quick. Isaiah 43 verse 3, I am the Lord your God. Isaiah 43 verse 10, so that ye may know and believe me that and understand that I am he. For Isaiah 43 verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord. Isaiah 43 verse 12, I am God. Isaiah 43 13, before the day was, I am he. Isaiah 43 verse 15, I am the Lord. Isaiah 43 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions. Seven I am's about Jesus in the book of John. Seven I am's about Jesus in Isaiah 43. Hallelujah. What more do you need to be convinced that this is a miraculous phenomenon that God furtively implanted into the Bible and has been revealed to us then in these last days when deception is at its highest? Hallelujah. Glory to God. What a miraculous book the Bible is. And that's just John. How about, here's another powerful one for John. In keeping with this idea of belief as a central theme in, in the new era of the New Testament, John 3.16 famously says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The most powerful and famous verse in the whole Bible, as anyone knows. This verse is the unofficial cornerstone of, of the New Testament era, the new thing era. Jesus, the, the, the New Testament is prophesied in the Old Testament as being the new thing that God's going to do, right? <laughs> so we're going to get to that. Put a, book, put, a, put a bookmark on that. However, we remind our fellow Bible students that this era is not the last era. There is yet another age coming after that begins when the church is presented to Christ in heaven as a bride and the kingdom age is going to commence. That's in the future. 
With that eschatological event in mind, please indulge me in making some temporary adjustments to John 3.16, and bear with me here, to reflect this glorious moment. So this is this is what I call the Bill McGregor NIV version. Now, I, I hate the NIV, so I'm being facetious. But here, let, <laughs> let me play with a verse from it, and just you imagine what I'm doing here and, and follow along, and you'll see that this is powerful. Here's John 3.16 reworked, okay, just temporarily. This is not canon, okay? So just, just follow, give me some slack. <laughs> For God so loved the Son that he gave him his newly begotten church. That's his bride, right? That whosoever yeah. believed has not perished and has everlasting life. Okay, that, that's cute, isn't it? It's cute. Now you may ask, why are we doing this? What, what is the connection of the tuning fork? I'm glad you asked. Isaiah 43 offers us this same rendition of, Isaiah, of John 3.16. For real, though, this time it's inspired. Okay, so let me read you my, the, 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 the Bill McGregor version of John 3.16, which captures eschatology with the same phrasing, but slightly flipped around. For God so loved the Son, S-O-N, that he gave him his newly begotten church, that whosoever believed has not perished and has everlasting life. Yes, I know that's a mess, but, it, but it's John 3.16 twisted around a little bit. Well, wait a minute. Isaiah 43, verse 4. Here it is for real, folks, okay? So you don't think I'm messing with it. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. That, my friends, is exactly the same wording as John 3.16 with, with the phrases slightly turned in different order. So John 3.16 captures the fact that God loves his son and bought for his son a church that they might have everlasting life. Read Isaiah 43, 19 again. Here it is. Ready? 43, verse 4. Since thou wast precious in my sight, that's the father speaking to the son, thou hast been honorable and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee, people, that's the church being given to Jesus, and people for thy life, because his life was sacrificed on the cross so that he could win his bride. Beautiful comparison. Now, do you see the Messiah, the Messiah is the precious and loved of God. And as a token for that love, he gives him people as his bride in return for him giving his life at Calvary. It is the inversion of John 3.16 and describes the new covenant found in Isaiah 43, verse 19. Beautiful little gem there that I wanted to give to your readers as a bonus. I'm going to give you one more out of the book of John. There's so many more witnesses. Here's one fast, John. Here's, here's a fast one. Isaiah 43, verse 12. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Uh, how many know that the book of John, the very first person to speak in the book of John, we have the account in John 15, verse 25. He said, ye shall bear witness because ye have been with me from the beginning. So you're going to be a witness because God is from, with you from the beginning. Exactly as Isaiah said, John the Baptist came in John 1, verse 7, as a, to bear witness of that light. So Isaiah 43, verse 12 says, Therefore you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. And John comes immediately saying, I am the witness of God, that, and th that we are the children of light. Now, here's a good, bit of powerful thing about the witness. In the book of John, it contains the word witness 16 times. That is nearly double the occurrences of the other three Gospels combined. So the, uh, Isaiah 43, 12 says that, that, that we're going to be witnesses. And the book of John is the primary gospel that uses the word witnesses more than any other. Now, here's, here's another powerful one from John. Uh, another famous act of Christ, as recorded in John, was his walking on the sea in John 6. Here we are, John 6, verse 19. Here's the quote. So when they had rowed about five and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. So a, a fascinating record of Jesus walking the water. Now, here's Isaiah 43, 16. Are you ready for this? <laughs> for, for, 43, verse 12, rather. 43, verse, verse 2, I'm sorry. For, chapter, Isaiah 43, verse 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. There's Jesus passing through the waters and being with his disciples. First, verse 16, Isaiah 43, 16. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters. <laughs> so there's Jesus walking on the sea, referenced in, 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 in cryptic in Isaiah 43 twice. 
and it recorded in, in John. Here's a fun one to close off, John. One more. The, the word, we have the what we call the fear factor now. The words fear not appear in Isaiah, in, in Isaiah 43 two times. Fear not. 43 verse 1, 43 verse 5. The word fear not also appears in the book of John's gospel three times. John 6, 20 and John 12, 15. Fear not twice appears in each piece of literature. Wow. So John, I, I, John is, is, is enough to blow your mind if, if nothing else. How about the book of Acts? Okay. Acts, chapter, Acts compares with Isaiah chapter 44. Well, where do I start? I will give you the powerful ones. Oh my John, this is full. Glory to God. Yeah, okay. All the good ones. All the good here, ones. here comes the powerful ones, okay? Zen has pointed this out in a previous show, and he's exactly correct. Some of the tuning for there, there are 600 and some odd tuning for connections. Some of them are trite. In other words, they don't really, they're not really game changers, but they're there and they're connected, and it's clear. Others are absolutely miraculous and powerful. Uh, but they all contribute to the phenomenon. So multitude of witnesses, confirming witnesses. So what I'm doing is I'm giving you the powerful, exciting ones. But you need to see them all. And when you get the book, you can do that. So, so I'm giving the powerful ones. Okay. Uh, Acts chapter 40, uh, uh, Acts is compared to the book of Isaiah 40, chapter 44. Let's start with this one. In Isaiah 44 and the book of Acts connection, we also, we also have the exclusive occurrence in which someone has their sins blotted out. An unusual phrasing in the Bible. Expressly citing this phrase, we compare the following. Isaiah 44, verse 22, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. So the phrase blotting out of sins, a rare, rare phraseology. Where do we find it? We find it in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. And to our readers uh, that get the tuning fork, we have another important uh, uh, word, word choice sensitive tuning fork connection. It's a, a tuning fork line number 69 at the back of the book, where we, we find that the King James translators are once again compliant and the other modern versions are not. I'm sorry to our publishers that are having their toes stepped on, but they are New World Order translations and they deserve to have their toes stepped on. Okay, Isaiah uh, line 69. Here we have the blotted out of the, in this particular tuning fork connection. And we're going to turn now to the King James rendition of those two passages. It is indeed blotted out and blotted out. How does the NIV use? The NIV says wiped out and swept away, not compliant. All right. Then we go to the, the English Standard Version. This, once again, the English Standard Version is compliant. Okay. Now, you can see if you're looking at the chart, most of the times they're not. But, most, but so, rarely they get it right. ESV is right. And the New King James Version also gets it right. But the NIV, the most popular translation in modern day, is wrong on that one for sure. So just shows to show you how the book works. Okay, let's move on. There is another exclusive event found in Isaiah 44 in the book of Acts. It is the apparent fact that soothsayers and diviners become angry when their fraud is exposed. Now, now this one's this one's a lengthy one, and it's going to really blow your mind. Right? This is the... <laughs> so... <laughs> understand what we're talking about. We're talking about in Isaiah 44, verse 5, we have the palm reader types, you know, the soothsayers, the diviners. They're, they, get, they get exposed, and when they're exposed, they become angry. It's an unusual event occurring in the Bible, and it's, and it's found in Isaiah 44, verse 25. It says, that frustrateth the tokens of the liars and maketh diviners mad. So God is recorded as, as making these people angry because he, he blows the lid off their fraud. Does that happen anywhere else in the Bible? Yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> One other place, in fact. And it's in Acts chapter 16, verse 16. I read intermittently through verse 22, intermittent reading. And here it is, verse 16 of Acts chapter 16. A certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination, so we're talking about the same word here, divination, divine, uh, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. So there's the soothsaying. Isaiah said divining and soothsaying. And Acts uses the same two words to describe that art. Now watch verse 19. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, because this girl got converted and stopped, but her, her sponsors became angry because they were making money off that girl. They caught Paul and Silas and commanded to them to be beaten. So we have the diviners getting angry when the lid get blown off their shtick. 
<laughs> and that's exactly what Isaiah talks about and the only two places where it happens in the whole Bible. Now, this time, we have a very rare mention in the book of Acts, and Isaiah 44 reminds us that God made heaven and earth. In Isaiah 44, verse 24, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretches forth the heavens alone and spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. All my friends that are flat earthers should love that verse. Now watch this one. Acts chapter 17, verse 24 says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth. Heaven and earth connected here. Now, let's, let's look at this. Also of note here, again, is that both verses are the 24th verses of their respective passages. 24th is where they're found. Now, watch this one. One of the underlying themes of the book of Acts is the conversion of Gentiles from idolatry to the worship of the true God. That's the whole idea of the book of Acts, right? That's kind of the name of the game for the whole book. Today, idolatry in the Middle East and Europe is all but gone, for the most part, and has been, and has been for centuries, thanks to the events recorded in the book of Acts. So because of the book of Acts and the events there, we pretty much wiped out idolatry in, 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 uh, in, in the Middle East and in Europe. Now, in perfect tune with this, <clears throat> Isaiah 44, verses 9 to 20, presents us with a long dissertation as to the utter folly of idol worship. Perhaps this was the very passage of Isaiah that was a favored text by the apostles as they preached to the idolatrous Gentiles let us compare Isaiah's treatise about idolatry line for line with some quotes on the topic from the book of Acts. So we're going to do a, multi, a multifaceted duty for connection here. Okay, so let's, let's look at this. The first thing we're going to learn about idolatry and why it sucks <laughs> from Isaiah 44 is in verse 17. It says, uh, in, in folly, God is quoting the idolaters where they say this. Deliver me, for thou art my God. God is, he's mocking the idolaters, right? Because the dollar, the, the idolaters can't, the idols can't deliver anybody from any trouble. So God is making fun of them. Deliver me, for thou art my God. This is kind of a hard humorous. Well, here's Isaiah 44, verse, 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 um, verse 17, okay? Uh, so that's, that's Isaiah 44, 17, I just quoted. Now, here is Acts 7, verse 40 saying unto Aaron, make us gods to go before us. So the same mocking that Stephen does about idolatry is the same mocking that God did about idolatry in Isaiah 44 and 17. So the first thing we learn about idolatry is, is that the idols were valued for their alleged safety that they offered, alleged safety. And that is taught in both those two patches where, I, where Stephen in Acts chapter 7 says, Make us gods to go before us for safety purposes. And Isaiah said, deliver me for thou art my God. So the same element of idolatry was the alleged safety that they offered, connected in the tuning fork phenomenon. Next one we learn about idolatry is that idol idols were to be fallen down unto and worshipped. Fallen down and worshipped. Isaiah 44, um, where it says this, verse 17. He maketh a god, he falleth down unto it, and worshipeth it. So Isaiah talks about idolatry, saying they're to fall down to it and they worship it. Isaiah, Acts chapter 10, verse 25. Now here's an idolatrous person who is about to become converted, but before he gets converted, he commits one last act of idolatry before he gets converted to Christianity. And his name is Cornelius, and he meets the apostles. And in, verse, in Acts chapter 10, verse 25, Cornelius met him, that being Peter, and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. So, but forgive the guy, he's about to get saved, but he, one last act of idolatry, of course, Peter was the idol, he falls down, it says he fell down and worshipped him. And that's exactly the, the nature of idolatry, as Isaiah talked about, falling down and worshipping. Cornelius did that very thing in Acts chapter 10. Now watch the next thing we have about idolatry. Idols were vain and unprofitable. In those words, not, not just in the idea, those words, vain and unprofitable. Uh, okay, Isaiah, what do you have to say about that? 44 verse 10, who has formed a god or molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing? So the idol is not profitable. Okay, what does that, the book of Acts say? 
The apostle said in verse 14, chapter 14, verse 15, the book of Acts, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities and unto the living God. The, the profitable for nothing, because they're vain. 24 connected. So we learned that vain and unprofitable. The next thing we learned about idolatry. Uh, one second, let me make a real quick comment. Um, yes, sir. Just, uh, Please feel free. This was the one thing that uh, was the difference between Abraham and his father Terah being a high priest for the king Nimrod, and he was also an idol maker, and uh, Abraham did not believe in, nor did he bow down, and he even made fun of uh, the idols, as is portrayed in the many stories, the book of Jasher, uh, speaking about Abraham and how he mocked his father's idols and then destroyed them and um, and then freed him and his family from the bondage of all that. And then they believed in, made covenant with the Most High God, Yahweh Elohim, and was led to the land of promise and promised uh, that his ancestors would inherit that land and his seed would number that of the stars. And so anyway, so yeah, this theme of uh, the false gods and idolatry is incorporated all throughout scripture because it's associated to the worship of the fallen angels. And um, so anyways, but let me turn it back over to you, Bill. We got just a couple minutes remaining. So if you would, maybe one more and then give out again your website contact and information and we will pick this up, um, not next week, but the week thereafter. Yeah, we'll we'll finish the book of Acts because I'm in the middle of a serial tuning fork connection. That being, okay. that, that being, there there we're, we're, we have a, a a one after the other attack on idolatry and showing how stupid it is, which of course is the theme of the book of Acts. So <clears throat> we we're now going to compare <clears throat> and discuss. The, the other fallacy about idols is that idols were made by men's hands. Okay. Yes. Uh, so Isaiah 42, verse 12, 44, verse 12, it says, and worketh it with the strength of his arms. That's a quote about, about idolatry. Now here's Acts chapter seven, verse 41. And they offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. So it says in Isaiah that idols are made by the arms of men and Acts says, made by their own hands, which, of course, is a part of your arm. So they're complying. Now, here's it's not even done. Acts 19.26 says it again. Gods which are made with hands. So, so they both said that they're made by man's arm, hands. Next, idols were made with graven art. Engraving. Watch this. Isaiah 44, verse 15. He maketh it with a graven image. That's Isaiah 44, 15. Now verse 17, same same Isaiah 44. He maketh a God even his graven image. So twice it's referred to as being graven. Acts, now we're jumping over to Acts 17, verse 29. End of the verse says, graven by art and man's device. Idolatry is a graven piece of art. Next, idols were made to look like men. Now here's something interesting. Isaiah 44, verse 13. And maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man. That's Isaiah 44, verse 13, talking about idolatry. How about Acts now? It's Acts chapter 7, verse 43. Stephen, with his great sermon, he said, The star of your God, Remphan, figures. That's a human body, right? That's a figure. Which ye made to worship them. Then Acts 14 says more. The gods, verse 14, verse 11. The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. So idols were in the likeness of men. They were figures of men. And that's exactly what Isaiah said. More. How about, uh, the? this is the best one. Idols were made by smiths. Uh, of course, being people that smite metal. Smiths. Okay. Isaiah 44, verse 12 says, The smith with the tongs, both worketh in the coals and fashioneth it, fashioneth it with hammers. Talking about the idols being made by a smith. Hello. Now go to Acts chapter 19, verse 20, 24. We meet a character named Demetrius, who was an idol maker, and he was rebuked. And, uh, and it says, Demetrius, a silver smith, which made silver shrines for Diana. We got a smith in both passages making idols. Hello, you got a miracle. This is the turning fork one after the other after the other, complying to the description of the fallacy and the nature of idolatry. And that's not all. Oh, watch this. The idol smiths, now here's another element. The idol smiths incite their fellow workmen, associates, to riot 
when their craft is threatened by the truth. Now, here's a really highly specified element. So we have idol smiths, people that make idols, they have a union. And when their trade is being threatened by monotheism, they go into riot mode. Okay, now, <laughs> watch this. Isaiah 44, verse 11. Behold, all his fellows, in context, that's the guy that makes idols, shall be ashamed. And the workmen, they are of men. Let them all be gathered together and let them stand up. So here we have the workers that are making idols gathering together and standing up. And, and, and being ashamed when they do that. That's what Isaiah talked about in 44. Hello. Where does that happen in the Bible? Oh, well, the book of Acts, I'll read you intermittently. Acts 19, verses 24 to 34. Listen, For a certain man named Demetrius of Silversmith, and whom he called together with the word.